All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to the um, the latest uh, edition of our interdisciplinary faculty seminar. Um, it is a pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Sonia Starr, who is the Julius Krieger Professor of Law and Criminology at the University of Chicago Law School. Um, her work focuses primarily on issues related to racial and socioeconomic inequality across various areas, including the criminal process, treatment of people with criminal records, employment discrimination, and DEI issues in education and healthcare, including a particular focus on statistical discrimination and algorithmic fairness issues. Her research methods include quantitative empirical analysis, as well as doctrinal and theoretical analyses of legal issues. She teaches courses related to criminal law, constitutional law, racial inequality, and serves as editor of the Journal of Legal Studies. Um, uh, Professor Starr will speak today on race and clinical perspective, I'm sorry, race and clinical practice guidelines, a legal perspective. So join me in uh, welcoming her to the McLean Center. Thank you so much, Dr. Angelis, and thank you all for being here and uh, to the McLean Center staff for um, all of their hard work. Um, so um, uh, I'm going to start with this. Uh, wait, why isn't this advancing? <laughs> it was advancing a second ago. There we go. Okay, um, so I'm gonna start with this caveat. Um, I'm a law professor, I'm gonna talk about the, the law, so it might sound a lot like legal advice. Um, uh, the law that I'm gonna talk about is within my academic expertise, um, but um, I, uh, and I think that medical providers should familiarize yourself uh, with these areas of law, but I don't want to breach the ethical norms of my own profession, and so I am required to tell you that I am not your lawyer, um, and um, that if you want medical advice, you should go uh, to um, somebody who is, um, and uh, that I'm not even a member of the Illinois Bar. Um, and so this is uh, academic commentary and not legal advice. Um, so, okay, so today, um, uh, uh, before I turn to the law, I wanna spend some time on an overview of the sorts of practices that I'm focused on. Um, which have been the subject of uh, extensive debate in medicine itself, uh, in other health uh, professions like neuropsychology, um, in, um, uh, and uh, in medical ethics. Um, less so in law, so I'm trying to add a, a, a legal perspective. Some of you may already be familiar with um, uh, some of these practices either because uh, they intersect with your own area of practice or because you've been following the debate about racialized clinical practice guidelines um, in, uh, the, in uh, medical fields, but some of you may not be familiar. So I wanna spend uh, the first part of my talk just kind of going over some examples and, and uh, laying the groundwork for uh, what um, we are talking about. So there's various ways that race gets taken into account in modern medicine. Um, and I've assembled here a loose and uh, probably not exhaustive um, taxonomy. Um, so um, the main focus of my talk today is gonna be what you see here under um, Roman numeral one, um, which are uh, instances in which an individual patient's race is taken into account in determining something related to uh, the course of their individual treatment, whether it's a specific treatment recommendation, a diagnostic decision, a prognosis, et cetera. Um, and um, in particular, uh, within those categories, I'm going to, uh, and, and so this is everything that falls under uh, part one here is what in the law we would call disparate treatment, um, which is to say, um, taking race into account, race itself into account in deciding um, how to treat a, a patient as opposed to um, what lawyers call disparate impact discrimination, which refers to um, a, which is subtler and refers to racial disparities that are produced by reliance on race correlated characteristics, but not on race itself, right? So here I'm, I'm talking about sort of the least subtle ways in which racial bias can be produced um, 
uh, into practice. Um, that is when uh, race itself is basically used as, um, as a variable. Um, so, um, and mostly I'm gonna focus on uh, things that fall into categories 1A and B here, um, race norming or correction of observed values or use of race as a risk predictor or a predictor of um, treatment uh, of treatment success. Um, so um, these are examples of where um, of sort of quantified uses of race in which um, some sort of algorithm um, is explicitly using race as a variable in order to make some kind of prediction um, or uh, um, or a recommendation. Um, so um, the uh, and, and those um, those uh, often fall into the category of what's labeled the clinical practice guidelines or CP um, or CPGs. They can be used for diagnostic decisions, prognosis, or care um, uh, care um, recommendations. And those have been the, the sort of central focus of the the recent um, ethics debate. Um, and um, before I uh, get to the law to the legal perspective, let me um, note that there's um, a slightly subtle distinction between par paragraph or, or between A and B here. Um, most of the debate, most examples that have been used in the, uh, that, that have uh, been centered in the public debate has concerned um, race norming category A here, um, which is what I'm going to mostly um, focus on myself, sometimes referred to as race correction. Um, and what that means is that some characteristic is observed for a patient, um, like say how much air they can breathe out or their performance on a cognitive um, a test in dementia diagnosis or the quantity of some chemical in their blood. Um, and then the characterization of whether that measurement is abnormal or how abnormal it is, um, is done, is adjusted based on race. It's done relative to the population distribution of that characteristic uh, broken down by race, right? So you ask, is it normal for a member of, um, uh, of the person's race? Um, race norming, has been particularly criticized because it often has the perverse um, and widely critiqued result that members of racial groups in which um, adverse health traits are more common, right? The, the uh, people who are um, uh, who disparately suffer some health condition um, become less likely rather than more likely to be able to access care, right? Um, um, and I'll give an example of that in um, uh, in a minute. Um, the there's a couple academic pieces out there that uh, um, defend the use of race in clinical algorithms. Well, there's a bunch that are specific to particular algorithms, but there's there's a couple pieces out there that sort of generically try to um, uh, defend the process. Most of them don't really focus on race norming, which is often harder to defend. Um, Instead, they focus on category B, which is the use of race um, as, uh, as a risk predictor. Um, and uh, here, again, race is being plugged into a formula in a way that can shape care decisions, but it's not really a matter of norming. It's about taking uh, population level differences and the prevalence of some health characteristic um, into account um, in predicting the outcome, you know, the, in predicting um, say, um, the outcome of uh, some medical uh, procedure or, or something like that. Um, the, this practice is still going to be um, legally uh, still racially disparate treatment, um, and it ha and also has raised um, some controversies. But it's worth noting that uh, the, the consequence of employing race in that way is often the opposite of what happens in race norming examples, because often it um, elevates the risk assignment that um, is given to higher risk groups as opposed to masking the higher risk that, um, that certain um, groups uh, experience. And for that reason, it might have a better chance of, of overcoming um, legal challenges on grounds of, of medical necessity, uh, et cetera. Um, even so, uh, can be critiqued for um, overly focusing on race as opposed to uh, other mediating characteristics like socioeconomics. Um, more on that in, in a minute. Um, let me say something briefly before I move on about the other two 
categories on um, this slide. So first, um, category 1C here. Um, so I'm going to focus today, as has the medical ethics debate, on quantified algorithms. But of course, it's possible for race discrimination um, in medicine to play out in less formal and less quantified ways as well. Um, and that would raise similar legal issues, although often would be harder to prove since there's no like algorithm written down um, that uh, say a potential plaintiff could point to in court. Um, but, um, and there's all kinds of reasons that healthcare providers might discriminate based on race or mechanisms by which they might do so, just as there are um, to explain discrimination in any other area um, of, uh, of society. But one that I wanna highlight here briefly is the prevalence of medical myths about essential racial differences, ideas that remain um, common in our modern world, even though they are grounded in a vision of race as a biological category that is largely um, quite outmoded academically, um, and uh, which um, also has very problematic roots um, uh, that sort of had its high point in uh, the slavery era and is highly tied to the history of of white supremacy. So, so doctors, even highly educated ones, um, are not immune to, uh, or in, and even, well, I guess all doctors are highly educated, but even recently educated ones um, are, uh, are not immune to these myths, right? Um, so for instance, a widely cited uh, study from 2016 um, by Hoffman et al. showed that 40% of first year medical students and 25% of fourth year medical students believed falsely that black people have thicker skin than white people do. Um, the authors reasonably suggest that this prevalent false belief might be one reason um, that uh, for the widely documented uh, fact that um, black patients who present similarly with um, uh, self-reported pain symptoms have more trouble getting access to, uh, to um, pain uh, to pain medications than white patients with the same symptoms do. Um, so um, the myth that black people are more impervious to, um, to pain has, it's, has specifically an ugly history. Uh, it was invoked in the slavery era, era to justify his pay brutal treatment. Um, the, uh, the prevalence of myths like this is tied to a view of race as fundamentally a biological category rather than as a social category. Um, and that vision of race has proven sticky, right? Hard to get rid of uh, entirely. Um, even though um, it has been undermined time and time again by evidence that for the most part, race isn't really a meaningful biological category, which is not to say that there's no you know, genetic differences between any world populations, but the way particularly in the United States where people of different races often represent, uh, you know, uh, like, wildly disparate groups, actually, um, the, uh, that is, uh, th that fall within um, uh, categories of race as we have constructed them, in which multiracial identities are common. Like, these are not silos in which um, health traits are very readily um, uh, categorized. Um, and, um, and in fact, um, the, although there are many population um, uh, level health disparities um, that exist according to race, um, most of them are much more strongly explained by mediating socioeconomic variables, right? Like the, um, I, like racial stratification um, across in, in poverty, right? Um, and, um, and, in, and in health access. Um, so, uh, so finally, um, let me let mention this last category, which I'll return to at the end which we might um, describe as race consciousness in medicine rather than as racially disparate treatment. So here I'm talking about medical or health policy decisions that are conscious of racial disparities and seek to reduce them, but not by making the treatment of individual patients turn on their individual race, um, but rather by making overall policy decisions that are informed by information about the hurdles that particular groups face to treatment and that seek to reduce um, those hurdles or seek to avoid adopting um, uh, rules or standards or practices that don't have a strong um, medical justification but have racially disparate 
um, consequences. Um, so I'll turn back to this category at the end of my talk, but the preview basically is that this category of race consciousness is legally quite different from individually um, racially disparate treatment. And my view is that, at least under current law, that although there is a sort of radical colorblindness movement that's pushing to make all race, to extract all race consciousness from decision making, um, that uh, at least under the current law, that kind of thing um, is uh, much more easily legally defensible. Um, okay, so having gone through this taxonomy, I want to jump back to category 1A, um, where I'm going to spend um, most of, uh, of my time and to give um, one example. Um, so, um, uh, so I'm going to focus on this one example that's well explored in medical literature, in the ethic, the current ethics debate, and um, even in sociological and historical literature, uh, which is the measurement of lung capacity using an, in an instrument called the spirometer, um, which is used for many purposes in pulmonology um, and for triage in ERs when people come in reporting um, uh, breathing difficulty. Um, so patients will breathe into a spirometer. It measures how much air they can exhale, uh, which is called um, lung exhalation volume. But in, um, in a modern spirometer, the readout doesn't just tell the doctor the actual exhalation volume. Um, rather, it shows a figure that is normalized by race, as well as a handful of other demographic, demographic characteristics, age, sex, and height, usually. Um, so um, basically, it shows how much the patient can breathe relative to others of their race. Um, instead of relative to people of all races. So this is like a classic race norming um, example. These images are from um, a book that's not by a doctor, um, I, but it's by Lundy Braun, she's a sociologist. I, I, I think this is an excellent history of science book. Like it talks about the, um, uh, about how spirometry measurements came to be racialized um, and the kind of surprising uh, ways in which um, uh, spirometry has influenced um, a bunch of different areas of medical practice and and other uh, um, forms of uh, and other social phenomena, including like legal accountability um, for um, for workplace pollution, for example. Um, so I, on the right, this is also um, an image from uh, from her book. Um, you can see so that's like a really old spirometer. That's like a newer. Um, a uh, spirometer in which you can actually see the uh, physical switches, one of which is labeled race. Um, and um, the newest spirometers have more modern digital interfaces and may call less attention to the race adjustment than that physical switch uh, does, but they are functionally similar in the algorithms um, that are uh, provided. So um, in a paper by Gaffney et al. in 2020, um, the authors work through, uh, give, give this illustrative example, which I will borrow here. So, um, so assume you have two patients, they're both, they're both male, six feet tall and 40 years old, and they both come in uh, uh, complaining of shortness of breath, and they um, both uh, have an actual exhalation volume into the uh, spirometer of 3.5 liters. Um, so if the patient is white, um, this, volume, uh, the measurement is called FEV1, will be flagged as low by modern spirometers. Um, that's because it's 78% of the average that's predicted for white men who are six feet tall and um, 40 years old. Um, if that patient is black, a spirometer that has race correction will categorize the same FEV1 as being in the normal range, 91% um, of what's predicted, which uh, is considered within um, the realm um, of normal. Now, you might think, okay, like, but surely this adjustment wouldn't be happening unless it helps doctors to make better care decisions, but there doesn't seem to be strong evidence of that. Um, just, you know, again, this is not like my own judgment. This seems to be what the medical literature has been recently uh, concluding. Um, there's a couple of studies that assess the prognostic significance of FEV1 adjusted and unadjusted by race. Um, and both of these studies find that the unadjusted volume, 
actual amount of air that our hypothetical patient um, is exhaling is the thing that predicts their later prognosis, right? And that you get worse predictions um, if you uh, make the, um, the adjustment um, by race, that there's basically no racial difference in the prognostic significance of the SCBFDP um, one. So why on earth are they making this um, correction? Um, well, it's not that it is, it comes out of nowhere empirically, right? It is the case that Black people on average uh, holding uh, the other demographic factors constant have lower lung exhalation um, volume. Um, but you can't just stop with that average comparison, right? You have to ask, why is this so? Why um, do, uh, do Black people on average exhale less air? Um, the race correction implies a biological explanation. It implies that it is normal for Black people to exhale less, um, uh, less air, and thus it is not a health concern unless a patient comes in and presents with an FEV1 that is not normal for Black people, right? Um, but there's overwhelming reason to believe that the answer to this question is principally socioeconomic and environmental as opposed to um, biological. Um, so, um, you know, Black patients on average, again, at a population level, face uh, health uh, disparities from, from the womb, right? Like because of uh, less uh, prenatal care, which might affect their, um, their lungs later on. The biggest factor probably in explaining this particular um, uh, disparity is differences in pollution exposure, both in the home and in the workplace um, throughout people's lives. Um, black people have far higher rates of asthma and basically every pulmonary condition as a result. Um, but that point doesn't make these differences normal, right? It makes it a problematic health disparity. And so what the race correction does by treating it as though this disparity is normal um, is like it, it, um, it, uh, it, it takes something that there's nothing wrong with rec with recognizing the disparity, right? Like with having data that shows that the disparity exists, but rather than treat it as a problem to be addressed, for example, by making sure that black patients get access to, um, to pulmonary care that they need, um, instead this normalizes it quite literally, right? Like uses it as the benchmark by which individual patients um, uh, health uh, will, be, um, uh, will be assessed. Um, so um, this is not a small correction, and so it has um, consequences that are not small, right? So, um, so uh, Extra and Menino um, do a study, like they, they draw data that included spirometry arguments from a broad-based population health study, so not a pulmonary uh, patient sample, um, but they're just looking for essentially the prevalence of uh, pulmonary issues in the general population. Um, and they find that if you, um, use the race correction, right? So if you use the numbers that the spirometer spits out normally, you find unsurprisingly, because of the race correction, you, you find unsurprisingly that the rates of uh, pulmonary impairment are similar um, across uh, white and black populations. Um, you have uh, in the vicinity of 9% of all uh, people in the population showing some degree of lung impairment and a little less than 1% showing moderate to severe lung impairment. But what happens if you don't use the race correction, right? Um, if you don't use the race correction, by the way, it leaves, there's no correction to the white values. Those are always considered uh, left unadjusted. But if you don't make that race connect correction um, to the black figures, then you get a measurement of 37% um, showing some degree of impairment and 1.7% um, uh, showing uh, moderate to severe impairment. So that means that the race correction leads to three quarters of mild impairments and over half of more serious impairments in black patients being missed. So that's like quite, quite consequential. Um, okay, so I'm not gonna work through other examples in that kind of detail, but I just wanted to flag a few other uh, recent controversies. One in neuropsychology has probably gotten the most attention um, of anything else, and that's because uh, it was at the core of a scandal involving the National Football League and its um, settlement uh, for 
um, concussions. Um, so the concussion settlement required um, patients to um, get assessed for dementia. Um, and the tests that they used, the NFL was sort of quietly behind the, behind the scenes rejecting, uh, telling the settlement administrators to reject any uh, submission of, um, um, of uh, test results that had not been um, subject to appropriate demographic adjustments, which included race norming. Um, effectively, um, and the NFL ultimately didn't deny this characterization, this race norming process assumed that the black players uh, started at a lower cognitive performance level than the white players, and therefore they had to show much more severe actual impairment in order to qualify for a payout. Um, and the NFL defended itself by saying, well, like this is just the norm in neuropsychology, we're just following um, the uh, the rules. And although that's a little bit oversimplified that the codes are useful within neuropsychology, they're not, um, it, uh, and, and it was quite cynical of the NFL because many, uh, many um, both physicians and uh, psychologists that, um, that contribute, that submitted um, assessments had them sent back by, um, because they didn't meet the standard that the NFL wanted um, it, uh, imposed. Um, still, they're not entirely wrong. It is a pretty common practice in neuropsychology. I think that there's um, a considerable debate uh, there. Um, so uh, the NFL did eventually back off of it under a sort of massive public um, uh, public pressure once um, two players sued them um, and uh, the, and they got extensive media coverage. Um, so in nephrology, there's been a multiple different um, debates about uh, race connection, uh, uh, correction, the most prominent one involves uh, the use of um, creatine in the blood to, um, to estimate uh, kidney function. Um, and the race correction there um, has the effect of reducing ki kidney disease diagnosis in black patients. Um, in obstetrics, there was a calculator, like a popular online tool that was used to calculate uh, successes of vaginal birth after C-section. Um, and that calculator is equal to higher rates of failure um, for uh, for black defendants, or not defendants, sorry, I'm, I teach criminal law, so, it's been, <laughs> so sometimes um, I, I, uh, I might say the wrong things. Um, so, um, uh, so black um, patients were predicted to fail and, and it steers them toward, um, uh, toward um, C-sections. Um, these, like, the VIVA calculator, I'll point out, is not is not really an example of race norming. It's more of an example of that second category that I pointed to of race as a um, as, uh, as a risk prediction category, um, and um, it uh, arguably isn't premised on the idea of biological difference, but rather just a recognition of disparity in outcomes, which um, I think is a disparity that really exists and that is largely socioeconomically mediated or mediated by differences uh, in um, access to care. And so those who defended it at the time said, look, if black patients attempting VBACs uh, really do have worse outcomes, shouldn't we be honest and say so if we're giving them medical advice about what path uh, to, um, to pursue? Um, but there were various problems with this answer that um, got, so it got, it got some pushback um, in uh, the literature in that field, in, in obstetrics. Um, and um, one is that um, it identified a health disparity that was real, but rather than respond by trying to improve care and outcomes for Black patients and say, like, what do we need to get our Black patients to a place in where they can have similar success um, with, uh, with VBACs as white patients do, um, and instead responded by steering them away from a care path that could benefit them. C-sections have higher rates of complications, a much longer um, recovery time. Um, so, um, and second, it was question begging, right? So if any given hospital or doctor um, believes in its own ability to provide equal, pay, uh, equal care to its own black and white patients, right? Um, then why would a provider or, or a hospital ever give different advice to its white and black patients about what to do 
um, based on race, simply based on the fact that in the aggregate in society, there are care differentials, uh, mostly across um, facilities. And if a particular provider or facility in the equity it seems like that is the problem to be addressed um, rather than just by steering uh, the care um, of, uh, of, of patients. Um, so um, all these criticisms are not coming from me. They're from experts in their respective fields. And indeed, the last two of these examples, the nephrology guideline and um, obstetrics, are both examples of where the clinical practice guidelines have been changed um, within the past two years precisely uh, because of these problems. Um, and so um, there have been there have been changes in some other fields, like uh, some in cardiology were just announced um, this uh, past month. Um, the kidney, uh, the change in the, in the kidney algorithm, um, uh, it's worth noting, is an example of where the solution that was settled upon was not simply removing race from the algorithm, um, because a lot of people pushed back and said um, uh, that it actually is less predictive as a measure. Um, creatinine levels are used as uh, a proxy essentially for something that's difficult to measure. Um, uh, uh, I'm going to mispronounce glomerular um, uh, filtration rates. Um, and, um, uh, and so that proxy, people argued, was just not as good for, um, for Black patients. But what ended up happening is they basically found a different that had, was as effective and equally effective across racial groups um, for uh, uh, to be used for the same like estimating purpose. Um, and so that was adopted um, instead. Um, okay, so that's the background on the medical and medical ethics debate. Uh, I've said little about the law so far, and I wanna point out that the debate as it's been playing out in, uh, uh, in um, uh, medical fields has also not said very much about the law, right? Um, so I have up here some sites to um, some good overviews um, of the medical ethics debate. Don't They don't talk about the law at all. Um, legal scholars have also not paid very much attention. Um, there's a professor called Dorothy Roberts at Penn who has been a strong critic in the legal academy, although uh, her she's more she's quite interdisciplinary and uh, her approach is a little more sociological. What I'm trying to add uh, in my work, including this recent um, paper called Statistical Discrimination, um, is really a more traditional legal doctrinal approach that tries to explain what does the law actually uh, say um, about these practices. Um, in this case, I use this as an example, along with examples of what we call statistical discrimination in um, other areas beyond, um, beyond healthcare. Um, Okay, so um, to me, it's a little strange that this debate has said so little about the law. Given that, um, you know, it's almost like, like a, it's like a commonplace that medicine is heavily operates in the shadow of law, like um, um, fear of litigation, um, and also the direct effects of, of regulation, right, um, um, affect many aspects of medical practice. So. Um, why not this one? You know, my assumption is that basically every doctor knows that they're not supposed to discriminate based on race, right? And that if a, um, if a patient, say a black patient came to your door and you said, sorry, I don't treat black patients, you know that you would be breaking the law, right? Um, and yet uh, the fact that um, many people are effectively being turned away from care um, or being different care recommendations, um, on the basis uh, of their race because an algorithm includes race as a variable doesn't seem to um, uh, like get people's antennas activated <laughs> like um, like there might be something wrong here but uh, but I, I am going to argue today that there, there is something legally wrong here right um, so um, let's talk about sources of law like what law governs the use of race in medicine. Um, well, first, about a quarter of medical practice in the U.S. occurs within public facilities, um, which are governed directly by the United States Constitution, um, uh, that per, and per, in particular by the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, which is the main constitutional tool that um, restricts um, uh, racial discrimination. Um, second, 
basically every other public uh, medical facility in the country is governed um, by Title VI of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which governs all entities that receive federal funds um, and applies very broadly. So like if any portion of a hospital, any portion of a university receives federal funds, then the whole university or the whole hospital um, is, uh, is governed by Title VI. Um, Section 1557 of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act also bars uh, discrimination um, in uh, healthcare. Um, there are federal agency regulations implementing those laws, um, which include, uh, which could come to include, I should say, um, a proposed uh, Department of Health and Human Services rule uh, interpreting Section 1557, which has some, some particular comments about uh, clinical algorithms, uh, which I'll get to at the end. And then states and localities have their own anti-discrimination laws. And these are all kind of layered on top of each other if there were ever a direct conflict between the two. Then the federal constitution law is governed by the House, federal statutes with regulations, all federal law affects state and local law. Um, but for the most part, uh, these are non identical, but fundamentally cutting in the same direction um, uh, protections for individuals from uh, discrimination. Um, I want to focus on the constitutional state. Uh, the for you guys who work in a private facility. Um, well, it's because the Supreme Court has interpreted Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, which does apply to the University of Chicago and basically every um, health facility, um, to provide race discrimination protections that parallel the Equal Protection Clause. So that is why, for example, um, in the recent affirmative action cases, the Supreme Court made no distinction at all um, between um, Harvard and the University of North Carolina, the two defendants uh, in those cases. It just applied the constitutional um, standards to both of them. And that's because of pre-existing doctrine that says Title VI, federal funds recipients, um, are basically governed by constitutional law when it comes to uh, race discrimination. So I'm gonna talk about the constitutional standard, but it does apply um, to private actors in, uh, in um, healthcare. Um, so, um, and I'm going to focus here on the law as the court interprets it, right? Um, the Supreme Court, that is, uh, which is sort of for better or for worse. Um, I've been a critic of uh, some of the court's um, colorblindness type uh, doctrines, um, but they're the law, and we should know the law as it as as it exists, right? Okay. So, um, under uh, the Equal Protection, the standards that apply to racial classifications. The standard of review is called strict scrutiny. Um, strict scrutiny means essentially that a court will look very closely at requiring a very demanding justification for racial classification. Strict scrutiny applies um, when individuals are treated differently from one another based on a suspect classification. Um, so I have highlighted things in a bunch of colors here because um, I want to highlight some different part, uh, different uh, things about uh, that rule. Um, so the first is that um, this is about individuals being treated differently. The Supreme Court has a very individualistic model of what equality is supposed to mean. Um, the Supreme Court never likes approaches to equality that talk about equality as between groups. Um, they're, they're very focused on individuals being treated equally without respect to their um, individual characters, uh, characteristics. And for that reason, um, you know, in the broad layer term, we're talking with the individuals who are subject to the model of social justice. You know, maybe the algorithm is fair compared to the equal predicted accuracy and cost per consumer of a right? The Supreme Court is not friendly to that kind of assessment of what, um, uh, of what uh, fairness means, or rather, that concept of fairness doesn't figure into its conception of equality under um, uh, the, the Equal Protection Clause. Um, it's very input that these are the um, it, uh, decision makers speaking in the right factors in the right constitution, and the Supreme Court has worked alongside the constitutionally prohibited 
um, factors and are they treating like individuals alike, right? So um, then uh, this idea of, of different treatment or disparate, uh, disparate um, treatment, this um, I flagged at the beginning, um, disparate treatment discrimination means um, either express classification like a law or a policy or a law term, um, that exp expressly categorizes based on race and treats people accordingly, or some form of intentional discrimination. So the discrimination between the, uh, the administration of a facially neutral law. Um, disparate impact on a group alone does not, uh, under the Supreme Court's doctrine, give rise to a constitutional right. Uh, that is, has been very widely criticized by law scholars, but it's been the law for 40 years. It's not likely to change. Um, so basically, the court focuses on uh, examples in which decision makers have treated like individuals differently. Um, so um, then uh, the idea that it has to be based on a suspect classification. This is essentially a causation standard, right? Um, so uh, under the access standard that's applied, race or another suspect criterion doesn't need to be the only factor that the decision maker considered. It's not like, the, you know, the plaintiff doesn't have to prove that the algorithm kicked every black patient out and allowed every white patient in, of course, it's only one of those factors. But if it can make a difference, right, if it's one of the factors that's considered so that people who are otherwise equal but are on the borderline might be treated differently uh, because of their race, um, then uh, that's going to get it subject to strict scrutiny and um, uh, and um, a, a plaintiff may be entitled to a process in which it has influenced the, um, the end. Um, so um, then what is a sub suspect classification? Uh, for our purposes, what's important is race, also religion, national origin, uh, sometimes citizenship status. Notice that uh, gender um, or sex is subject to a lesser standard of strict scrutiny. Um, and categories like age are not subject to elevated scrutiny at all. So it's, and, and most types of classification um, that can be both a yes or a no or a uh, like only get what is caused called rational basis for the generally problematic, um, you know, age discrimination is statutorily prohibited in, in uh, some contexts of employment, but um, so it's not like the arguments uh, against racial classification for the other side are going to apply to all Um, it's just that special legal standards apply when race is involved, and partly the reason for that is because of the ugly history of racial discrimination. Uh, it usually hasn't gone well when we allow um, government decision makers, or in this case, uh, private, uh, but uh, federally funded decision makers to make decisions based on race. Um, so, um, okay, so what actually is the strict scrutiny test then? Um, the rule is that disparate treatment based on race will only be upheld if it is narrowly tailored to advance a compelling state interest. Uh, this is a very demanding standard. Overwhelmingly, if strict scrutiny applies, um, courts will strike down the policy that is um, not 100% of the time. Um, there are instances in which it's been upheld for decades. Affirmative action in higher education was one of those instances. Um, and the idea was that uh, some affirmative action policies were narrowly tailored to advance a compelling interest in educational diversity. Um, the court recently overruled that. Um, and so if anything, I think they've been moving more toward the, the fatal impact approach. Um, the narrow tailoring requirement requires ruling out of race neutral alternatives. So the decision, the, the defendant in the protection case um, in which strict scrutiny applies has to show 
that they that they really comprehensively searched for race neutral ways to accomplish the thing they were trying to accomplish, and that all of the reasonably available such means would have failed to accomplish um, their uh, their interests. And that interest has to be compelling, right? It has to be a very strong um, interest. Um, and it's the defendant's burden to show that they considered alternatives, that they had good reason to reject it, and that their interest uh, is, um, is compelling. Um, and uh, the court has been increasingly reluctant to recognize compelling state interests uh, the just right reason even um, rather than uh, increasing um, disparities. So that's the, the upshot of uh, the the recent um, uh, affirmative action decision. Okay, so this is the practice test, which is the practice guidelines. How are they going to do? Um, I think often, at least, maybe not, I'm not saying none of them can survive this test, uh, but I think doctors and hospitals that use uh, racial identification need to be prepared to defend them against very searching review in court, which means they're going to need strong evidence. And sometimes I think at least uh, that evidence is not going to be there. Um, so strict scrutiny is going to be automatically triggered because they are racial classifications. That's explicit. In the algorithm, um, that means that they could Um, in practice, we may not know that, but if they had an item of the documents, then it's right there, right? Like, there's a speaker. Um, um, the, um, the clinical practice guidelines are public. Um, um, and so uh, this is relatively easy to prove compared to other um, racial discrimination cases. Um, I think proving a compelling interest would probably be difficult in many of the cases. Um, because um, the practice test asks uh, the literature that I was just pointing to suggests the medical evidence is at best hotly contested, and the strict scrutiny standard is not deferential to the expert judgments of uh, doctors, for instance. It does not say in which, you know, if that's why this place, you courts have nothing to say about it. It actually says, no, you guys have the burden to show that um, if you want to use race, that there's a really uh, strong justification for it. Um, and then the other thing is that um, in um, these, um, there, uh, these like recent studies and um, sometimes uh, changes in the official CPGs based on those studies have illustrated the effectiveness of race neutral alternatives, right? Um, and um, and so, you know, for instance, the the, the CPG in the nephropathy. In the, in the guidelines for estimated disease, um, uh, that should have been in effect for, I think, nearly two years now. Um, it's been estimated that, like, at some, I don't, I don't know exactly number of what fraction, but at some non trivial fraction of doctors still need to get the data. That is slow, and that's because it's just slow to get these doctors um, uh, to change their practice. If you're a surgeon, you can get your treatment, or if you're a surgeon, you can get your data. Um, so, um, uh, uh, but now that the official guideline has changed, anyone who continues to use the old racial list guidelines is going to have a really, really difficult time getting them um, in uh, in court because we now know that a race neutral alternative um, uh, exists. Um, so. Um, and the last key doctrinal point that I want to emphasize is that a long line of Supreme Court doctrine um, heavily disfavors racial discrimination when it's based on race or other categories that receive um, special scrutiny. Um, so, um, what do I mean by racial 
Um, the economists typically uh, try to differentiate what you may look at these first two things. That's what you said. Um, they differentiate between um, what they call these basically surplus items like defects. Um, versus differentiating for the two, which is the use of the protected characteristic as a proxy for something that they really appreciate. I don't like the books is that you know my data show me that defects is more likely to uh get drunk or less productive they have some sort of advantage in that. Um and even when it's used as justification, say for um for workplace discrimination, some economists defend this practice. Um economically efficient, right? Like why not use all of the information that you have available? There's actually been a couple um, economists who have, who have dived into the um, debate about, uh, about clinical practice guidelines and said, you know, essentially just like everywhere else, why not use all the information that we have um, available? Um, but the production doesn't make this So we have to on racial discrimination, um, in part because of the idea that like not every predictor, that some predictors are proper, like even if they were associated with some sort of data that supported a generalization, that they're just too problematic to predict, basically. Um, that it promotes uh, disparity and tends to um, be associated with, uh, you know, like a, a toxic history um, and uh, and therefore just shouldn't be used. Um, and so it, there's a long line of cases holding that such generalizations, general that statistical generalizations, although it's fine in general for assuming certain things, it's really kind of like in favor of this on a lot of topics. And that the justification is really right. Uh, take that out to the uh, statistical generalizations, uh, to take that away. Um, the, the key doctrine on this was actually developed in the sex discrimination context uh, in, in, in a series of cases. Um, most of them in the 1970s, some of them involved uh, benefit administration. Um, the doctrine is a structured sort of phase process. It's um, the, uh, based on the assumption that uh, men were likely to be the target of um, But the court said you still can't structure the policy into the that it doesn't accurately um, describe. Uh, in a case in the 1990s involving the Virginia Tech Bridge, which uh, people who did not understand, uh, they were not interested in all kinds of empirical evidence that went to other cases. We have all of these physical standards for training size and so forth. But, uh, you know, they used the task standards um, in general for uh, and magnitude of the physical standards they were There was a, a law that basically set different drinking ages for men and women, and the state submitted uh, really strong empirical evidence of men drinking age being more than the And the court was like, not all men, you know, you can't do that, you can't make that generalization. Um, so most of the cases involved gender because men and men were dominated, or the theory of time in which was still common in the 1960s and 
decisions in the law. Um, and that was the period in which this, um, the, this law was uh, developed. But in the cases in which it's come up, the court has to see that the court is even stronger for race than for gender and sex. The court has said that for sex discrimination, the court that the government is sometimes in general, in particular in the cases of pregnancy or uh, breastfeeding, um, basically physical sex differences often associated with uh, the reproductive process has been said. But nothing like that exists for this. This is the case of the sex is a biological um, We're not going to allow uh, that kind of generalization in the race context. Um, in a pretty recent case, uh, they threw out a big um, Ineffective out. Um, and they didn't care whether they're about the merits of the statistical evidence. They were just like, no, not gonna, not gonna try to justify the differential treatment um, on the basis of that kind of generalization. So why is all this relevant? Well, we can't see what happens by the way. That's their definition um, you could probably come up with, and I'm, I'm sure it, you know, in the literature you can find examples of uh, examples in which there really does appear to be some um, some group based difference that a racial adjustment is really necessary to account for. But even in those instances, the same thing can only happen in the average. Um, there's more variability within race. Um, even the people who are the strongest defenders um, of, um, of uh, racialized uh, CPGs will concede that point, right? Um, and the, the result is that when you give people different race identities, and um, the implication, even though the court has not, I, I should say, the court has not decided a case like this in the context of clinical practice guidelines, right? Um, so I'm extrapolating from the way this court is um, But I think it would be hard, uh, given that it's just a lot, to justify them given that they are all you know, saying that each individual based on the fact that uh, there's some um, difference in, in average values that are observed. Um, okay, so does all this mean that medical practice is To uh, ignore race. Um, the Supreme Court's doctrine certainly favors a colorblindness norm when it comes to individual level racial class. Um, and it does so regardless of people's The use of race is more policy level, right? So it's not about treating individuals differently because of the impact that they will reflect on their individual race, um, but rather making broad health policy decisions, including maybe the design of other factors, other Um, given that we have awareness of uh, racial inequities, right, of the 
awareness of sharing and the goal of trying to reduce bodily injuries. Um, those types of practices are not typically used in the by courts. Um, courts um, do strike down kind of facially neutral treatment of individuals sometimes if it is based on like an invidious notion of uh, increasing racial disparities. Um, uh, say people of color from white spaces, for example. Um, uh, and, um, but then, uh, policies are motivated by um, what courts have been called benign racial um, rotation gap gaps or genetic racial gaps in the world. Um, even though courts make very strong decisions about the courts have been more So, for example, like in the COVID More burdens subject to the population. But they don't involve burdens. So, so I'm trying to understand if, uh, let's say, an organization has racialized guidelines, and their clinical practice guidelines come out and say, you know, uh, black patients have a higher risk of uh, recurrent thyroid cancer, and therefore they should get more radioactive iodine and such like that. Mm -hmm. And um, when those guidelines are sent out, there's always, in every clinical practice session, there's always this disclaimer that this is not meant to define the standard of care, but rather the general recommendations of practitioners. Yeah. And so, so it, it seems to me that if a patient said, I got radioactive iodine because of racialized guidelines, I'm going to sue someone based on you know, legal precedent. If they go to sue the organization that put out the guideline, they would say, we don't practice medicine. We just put out guidelines. Yeah. It's not up to us. If they sue the practitioner, the practitioner would say, I didn't make my decision based on the guidelines. I was I made an individualized decision, just like the guidelines tell me to do. It just happens. Right. Right? Okay. So, so I'm just curious, like, and I'm not arguing from an ethical point of view. It, it would be inappropriate to utilize it. But I'm just wondering from a legal perspective, how do these things work out? Yeah, so I think a couple of things there. One is, although we look at 
So um, I didn't uh, go to my last um, uh, couple slides, um, well, one of which was about this new proposed uh, uh, the notice of comment period has been closed on it, and I don't know whether it's ever going to go into a law, but it does have like several paragraphs of commentary uh, in the commentary section. Uh, the kidney guideline and the, the NFL uh, case. Um, but one of the things it does talk about um, some of it is actually what is responsible and some professional needs. And it says some of the things that are just repeatable. Uh, and so basically, it's a it's saying to they're, I think they're trying to warn providers that um, you uh, they they use the phrase overly rely. Uh, it's it's quite confusing, but I think they're sort of warning that you know essentially if it's provable that we're using the other drugs, that we're not going to use the other drugs, is going to be a problem. Um, and the facilities so uh, the uh, the ACA which is what this regulation is interpreting uh, I think it's two provisions of the ACA it's regulates facilities um, or institutions that receive um, federal funds um, and so there uh, so under title six the plaintiff would uh, and so there might be questions in particular cases about like figuring out who is responsible, but the upshot of this regulation is kind of wording Thank you. 
Yeah, so I think um, that for you, uh, in the ACA instance, I think institutions and individual doctors have responsibilities. And so I think, you know, it's possible. I mean, this might just involve um, like other legal documents and not just you know, this policy forces the nation to have a when you get to the nation, you might be able to um, pull them in towards that. Because let's say somebody is by um they sue um you know claim one is not the real harm. Two is traces to the right? Because they uh, uh, I'm a little less interested uh, because there haven't been a lot of lawsuits so far. This is another slide. I can get to. Um, and so these things are surfacing in courts. I have yet to see a lawsuit that's just a plain lawsuit against a provider by a patient who um, uh, suffered harm. Uh, but Um, okay, any other questions? All right, thank you. Should I end this soon? Sorry. Um, I will take yeah, you can get.